Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. This week's podcast is all about pest management and is the second part of my interview with Kelly Vance. If you haven't listened to the first part, I'd suggest checking that out first, and you can learn a bit more about Kelly and his background in horticulture and integrated pest management. Now on to the show. So, uh, getting back, I had this list of questions and <laughs> we keep, we kind Sorry, of, we kind of been floating around them. No, I've, I've enjoyed our discussion. Um, I, I go did into the talk, weeds. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk about your experience in coming from large greenhouse and production setting. Like what practices did you see that you were using on the horticulture side that hasn't really made it into cannabis that, um, you think should, should be implemented? Um, you know, I used to say, and I will, I, I'll go back and I'll, I'll just repeat the crop staging just because I, I believe that all things, that fundamental things need to be repeated until you get annoyed with them because at that point it's concreted into your head. Crop staging is one. Um, I, I used to say quarantine, although I am starting to see more of it. So I, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see that. Um, and in fact, the grower who was the absolute best at it that I ever met, um, after two years of, of practically begging him, uh, now works for us. That's our rep, Saul, who I was working with at the time. At, um, he was a large greenhouse cannabis operation in Salinas. And he had a whole greenhouse set up for quarantine of incoming plants, um, dip, dipping protocols. I'm sure that you guys have talked about dipping on the show by now. Um, an actual mm -hmm. quarantine after the fact before any of these plants go out into any of these greenhouses. Um, but I still see tons of people, especially this time of year, the early beginning of the season, they're bringing in plant material from all over the place. Sometimes I've had them tell me that, yeah, I know that I got, I know that I got my russet mites from X, Y, Z. And then the next year they buy from the same person and okay, well, let's pretend they're the only source you still need your plants, but you haven't implemented some kind of a quarantine when you know for a fact that you've had issues from these. So that's a huge one. Um, and one that I see a lot of, but not enough of too, when you consider the value of this crop is just general PPE in the greenhouse. And I don't know what the proper term, because all of this falls under cultural control in the, in the tired old IPM pyramid. But, um, you know, you just don't see any control of who's working in what area and then moving to other areas. I'll say that sometimes I ask growers to do a little more than I used to do in the greenhouse, but I, cause we didn't really, a lot of this stuff, it, it wasn't like we had it running like a Swiss watch in my greenhouses. We had very chaotic days where I would end up in every greenhouse by the end of the day. But for the most part, we had our stock fuchsia greenhouse, which is, those were our mother plants. So, I am not going to go spend all day in the uh, Thumbergia, which I know are crawling with spider mites and thrips, and then go work in the stock fuchsias. But I see plenty of people in cannabis grows. And when you get into an indoor cannabis grow, I'm sure you've been in enough of them. Like these guys are paying a lot for that facility. So they're trying to use every square foot for plant canopy as possible. So like, unless you are a teeny tiny little person, it's impossible to walk through one of those rooms without, I like to say, getting, getting to know their plants. So mm -hmm. there's no way you're spending all day in this room that has spider mites, has aphids, has whatever. And then you're going to go work in the moms for the rest of the day, taking cuts. Um, that to me is just like a no brainer, but it's very frustrating when I see it happening and you see these small facilities that just keep recycling their problem. Um, yeah, Justin, uh, Justin has a good analogy for this that I kind of liked. He looks at it like a river. So he always starts at the head of the river, like the area that has the least amount of uh, pest pressure. You know, like your mother right. room is, in theory, should be your cleanest part, yep. you know, and propagation. That needs to be the cleanest part of your facility. And it's the easiest area to control because you have the least amount of canopy. So you should be able to keep that area clean. 
and then you work yeah. your way through and end. You always end in the flower room because these are your oldest, you know, probably most stressed finishing plants that are going into senescence. And those are the ones that are going to have, in theory, the worst amount of bugs. And that's the first thing that when uh, when we visit, uh, whether it's a farm or a, a and it's no matter what the crop is, no matter what the layout is, the first thing that we ask is, do you have any areas that are really infested? And if they say, yeah, we should take me there last, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that that uh, we try to stay on top of is uh, we try to keep our own PPE on us as well. So a lot of times if we show up to a facility, a lot of times they provide you a Tyvek or, you know, at least a, a, a lab coat or something to wear. Um, occasionally, you know, you get there and even I've done it where even the, the growers themselves aren't wearing the stuff. I throw it on just because I don't want to be, for one, I might be visiting three or four uh, operations that day. And for mm -hmm. another, I don't want to be two months from now when you have a problem and you start thinking, yeah, I bet it was that bug guy. He walks around at bugs all day and he came here and walked around in our plants. So uh, yeah, that, that I like to tell growers, try to have, I like the river analogy. I might, I might, uh, <laughs> uh, who, who, who's, whose was that? So I can properly credit them if I use it. Uh, my buddy, Justin, I think you met him at, uh, the biocontrol conference. He was the yeah, guy yeah. that talked, um, yeah, yeah. That's he's a good working way with Alec. At it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I, I just would add, like for me, when I go visit these facilities, uh, I'll only go to one in a day and I'll make sure I'm putting on clean clothes, fresh out of the laundry, um, clean shoes, especially like, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to go walk around my farm and then go visit a facility and then it, I have had to visit two facilities in one day and I literally did a full clothing change, um, in that case. Yeah. And especially my shoes, not because, yeah. uh, you know, like you said, you just don't want to be a potential vector. Um, and a lot of places no. don't, I find don't have Tyvek suits or PPE. Um, and I, you know, frankly, I don't know that that's a complete solution. I think it's part of the picture. Like we want to do everything we can to reduce transmission, but I think right. every facility should just plan on getting bugs, plan on getting, you're going to have to oh, deal yeah. with root aphids and hemp resin and thrips and all of these things. Uh, don't think that any facility is immune from these. So you better have a plan ahead of time and you should, right. I think biocontrols are a great preventative. Maybe we should talk about that a little bit. Um, just because you don't have insects now, doesn't mean you shouldn't be using biocontrols. Oh, Now's man, the perfect time for biocontrols, right? Prevention is the key for us to have success. And it is, it's one of the things that you have to maybe slightly relearn uh, or at least learn from a different perspective if you're switching from conventional pest management into biocontrol is but, but it is funny though because I do recall back to my days of of doing a lot of spraying and uh, a lot of the classes that we would take when we were getting our CEUs for our applicator license you know they're telling you do preventive sprays so they're even talking about spraying before you have a problem so um, it is kind of a hard thing to get a grower used to the idea of, well, I don't have pest pressure. Why am I putting out bugs? And one of the challenges of that to me is a lot of times chemicals only have one rate. So, you know, that's the amount that you mix, whether you have a little bit of thrips or you have a lot of thrips. A lot of times chemicals will have ranges uh, where you have low rate, high rate. And that's when I do try to put that into perspective for growers where, um, the whole concept of having a presence in your crop to make it unattractive for pests in the first place is what keeps the control when they do show up because they're outnumbered. Um, if you wait until you have a pest problem to address it, it's all about numbers. It's all about outnumbering and overwhelming the pest. So when you have five or six thrips, and here's the thing, I have never ever in my life been in a pest free crop. And I've had growers tell me they grow pest-free crops. I don't believe them. I have never grown a pest-free crop in my entire career. Um, when you start out with a fresh new dip, you need to assume that you didn't get thrips eggs that might be in the leaf. You need to assume that you might not have gotten all the spider mite eggs. You need to assume that you might not have gotten every last hemp russet mite. So under that theory, there's no such thing as a pest-free crop. But getting started early and preventive and having these things in place is what prevents the infestation in the first place. 
And for some pests, hemp russet mite is the main one that I use as an example. On a scale of one to 10, with one being one hemp russet mite in my whole greenhouse, and 10 being, oh my God, I've, I've closed the doors, we're out of business. Anything past three, we can't really do much about. We can, but it's gonna cost a lot of money. So hemp russet mite is the main one that I use as the example. Like at this point, everybody's either had them or they're at least aware of them. The people that did have them caught them too late the first time. That's usually a, a pretty common thing and they saw what it cost them. Um, a good one to compare it to in the ornamentals world is uh, in, in poinsettias, everybody talks about uh, white fly the most. That is the most prominent pest in poinsettias. It's where most of the research goes into. A mite that doesn't get as much coverage as a lot of other mites is called the Lewis mite. Lewis mite is a pest in poinsettias, but the problem with Lewis mite and poinsettias, it doesn't show damage until far long after the feeding. So you have to be attacking these Lewis mites very, very early before you know that you have them, before it looks like you have them, no visual symptoms on the plants. Um, and the thing is, if you spray that, when you if you find it early and you spray it, you've now taken some of the sprays options out that you might need later for white fly. So that's a good example right there of like, you have to go in preventively against this almost non-pest to keep your pest management program in place down the road for your white fly, if that makes sense. And yeah, I want to highlight something you said back uh because this was uh new this was new information to me within the last year i didn't realize that thrips can lay eggs inside the leaf so just because a plant looks clean even with really careful yeah. scouting that quarantine room is super important because thrips could still show up for sure I and mean, that's the the western flower thrips the mama basically has almost like a little mice that she just opens the leaf and oviposits in there so now there's there's i'm sure that there are highly skilled entomologists with keen eyes out there that can spot what thrips eggs inside of a leaf look like. Um, I can't. <laughs> I've never seen it that I can tell you with certainty that's what that is on that leaf. I don't know. I know that I've seen thrips emerge out of leaves that looked 100% pest free to me. So that's one right there that even dipping you know, I love dips and I encourage anybody to get into doing oil dips if you're bringing in a lot of plant material that you just don't know. Why take the chance? Um, Suzanne is out there spreading the word about it. There's, there's it's a lot of info available now about it online. Really have no excuse. It's cheap. Just do it. Um, but still, know that you might not have got thrips eggs that might be inside of the leaf. Thrips are one that get overlooked in cannabis a lot because they're not seen as as big of a pest as spider mites or aphids or hemp russet mites. Um, one thing I like to remind people of, thrips vector more pests, more plant viruses than any of those other bugs. Um, taking the chance with a plant virus, if you've, I mean, I think we're all starting to learn the impact that human viruses have. Um, if you've ever seen a plant virus move through a greenhouse or move through a room, the devastation that that causes. And I have been in a greenhouse situation where my own negligence at treating thrips in a crop that I that I didn't think they were a problem in. And I'll, I'll say it's a crop called coleus. Coleus are a very colorful leaved plant. Um, not a lot of flower production in a coleus. Thrips get on them. They don't really damage them. I never saw what I considered significant thrips damage. I wasn't asleep at the wheel on them. I just wasn't prioritizing them as a pest. Uh, meanwhile, they spread INSV, impatient necrotic spot virus, through that crop to the tune of about $25,000 worth of plants by the end of the season. Um, stacked up plants wrapped shrink wrapped in plastic because you now have to dispose of them in a different way because they are infected and you have to dispose of plants that might not be infected but you just don't know so uh that was from me not paying attention to thrips so thrips eggs in the leaves and it can really lead to problems down the road now i know that there's still a lot of research and a lot of work being done to research this uh this uh, hop latent viroid in, in cannabis and the jury's still out on if cannabis gets certain plant viruses, but I mean, why wouldn't it? That's the way I say it. Why wouldn't it? Why, why, why would we not assume that thrips that vector 
in, you know, viruses to all these other plants that they would be, that they wouldn't do the same to this plant. Have you, you know, for a while there, it seemed like every weird uh, display of, of, of leaf damage was being uh, called tobacco mosaic virus, but I've never yeah. seen an actual pathology report confirming it on cannabis. Um, and I, no. I think talking to Suzanne, she hadn't seen it either. I've, it's always a buddy's friend that has the lab results, yeah. you know, but no yeah. one's ever been able to produce them. Yeah. You haven't seen them yet. seen it yet either. No, I had, I had one grow that I worked with out in Bend, Oregon that they, they I mean, then these guys, it's, it's, it was such a tragedy because the first time I visited their place, I told them, I'm going to brag about you guys to every grower I meet from now on and, and guilt trip them for not having the same setup that you do. I mean, these guys had their PPE dialed in. They had uh, zip up rubber doors between the rooms. They had maps in each room. If you came in this door, you leave out of this door. So there was like a forced river there. You couldn't go back out the way you came in. Really cool guys and very talented, very smart and look forward to working with them. And then, about a month later, the guy sends me a picture of a plant that looks like it has TMV and said, is this TMV? I said, I, I don't know. I, I was very honest with him. I'd only been working with cannabis for about a year. I said, I really don't know. I have no idea what it would display like in this crop. And he said, well, that plant looked beautiful two days ago. And I said, you know, I was out of state at the time. And I said, I can't get out there right now. I can come you know, like Monday or whatever, as soon as I can get there, I said, do me a favor, send me a picture of that exact same plant tomorrow from the same angle and everything. And he did. And somewhere I have those two photos. I put them side by side in one day, whatever, I, I guess I probably won't ever know what it was. It was definitely viral because I've never seen anything impact a plant that fast, not even spray. I mean, it was, it was just, it looked exactly like TMV, except it was starting at the top of the plants. So I called this guy. I said, look, you need to get a test kit that can test for TMV, INSV, uh, uh, TSWV, which is a tomato spotted wilt virus. I mean, anything you can. I ended up connecting them with Agdia, which is the company that produces the, the test kits that we always used for years in the greenhouses. And these things aren't cheap. They had to pay like $1,500 to get a box of them because they don't sell just one. So they tested all of their suspect crops, three tests, and negative for every one of the plant viruses. Meanwhile, they lost about, I don't know, 100 plants to whatever was going on there. The next, sometime when we see each other, again, remind me to show you the photos. It's, it's horrible. It looks like, it, it looked like TMV. It was very decisively not TMV. But hmm. there's also so maybe lately... Maybe there's something out there. Yeah, maybe there is... I, the only thing I've ever seen damage plants that quickly, and this is <laughs> this is an awful but yet kind of funny story. Uh, back in the day, we were when uh, I was I was growing outdoor uh, with my my brother and my father. Uh, I had taken a, a sprayer and filled it with bleach to bleach an old room that we had been growing yeah. in 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 yeah. a giant garage warehouse on this property, and right. then my dad, without me knowing took that sprayer and was like, oh yeah, I rinsed it out and then went and sprayed. I can't remember what it, it might've been like neem oil or a compost tea. I can't remember something out of that sprayer onto right. the plants. And I came out the next day and there was just like necrotic damage on the leaves and I couldn't figure out what it was. And literally over the course of three days, the entire yeah. crop was, was just gone. It looked like the worst case of botrytis you've ever seen. Um, it was just, my brother is still mad about it. Um, yeah. I, I chalked it up as a learning experience, but it was, I mean, these were, this was a lot of, of plants well, mine, uh, and I'm not saying that's my, what they did, but it was, it was, my, it was bad. My probably biggest uh, time of ruining, of ruining plants uh, from a mistake. And it's funny cause it's actually something that I find myself talking a lot about working in cannabis is the dangers of a sulfur and oil treatment too close together which I learned the hard way with a greenhouse full of African violets, which get powdery mildew like you wouldn't believe. And I had sulfur burners in there, determined that that wasn't doing enough and did a very light micronized sulfur spray. And it wasn't five or six days later that an oil spray was done 
I didn't do the oil spray, but I also didn't communicate with the person who did. And in, in his defense, he, he was still learning a lot and he didn't have any idea about the interactions between the two. And uh, yeah, a lot of cannabis growers have learned the hard way about going after PM or russet mites with sulfur and oil and doing them within 10 days of each other. I mean, it's, the plants look probably about like your, uh, your plants did. They got hit with the bleach. Yeah. Well, it was so, it was so rapid. <clears throat> hey, I did have a, I did have a hemp russet question. I know we're jumping around a little bit, but, uh, I had a, I was on the phone with a grower the other day and he was telling me that he claims he got hemp russet from his soil. Now I want to clarify, not kiss soil, not my soil. Okay, uh, we don't work right. with this grower <laughs> just so I don't okay. get people freaking out. But uh, <laughs> right. he claimed that the hemp russet can actually propagate in the soil, which I thought it was exclusively a, a plant that lived in, or sorry, an insect that lived in the canopy and exclusive only to cannabis or right. Hemp. What, what's, now you, I mean, I'm open to being wrong here publicly, obviously. You're certainly, what's, uh, you're you're certainly right about it being exclusive to hemp and cannabis. Um, there are other areified mites that at a glance don't, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Most entomologists without slide mounting them would not be able to tell the difference. So there's a lot of mites that look a lot like hemp russet mites that are not hemp russet mites. And one of the fun little things I play with in my head sometimes is do we know that they only get hemp russet mite? <laughs> it could be a different one in there too, a different areified. Um, but trust me, we all know that one is as many as you need. So uh, they do all of their feeding and their, uh, their, uh, the lively part of their life on the leaves, on the foliage, feeding on the canopy of the plant. Now, here's where the jury's out since I'm sure you know, and it's been said many times, but you know, a hemp and cannabis exclusive pest is going to have little to no official research done on it. Um, the, the actual university-based studies into hemp russet mite are limited to a couple of things that Colorado State's put out. So they haven't been studied at length to the level of something like a spider mite, where we know a lot about the two-spot spider mite, you know. So where the jury's out is the diapause part of their life cycle. So Spider mites do diapause into soil, or if they have enough leaf litter, if they can't get to good soil, if you have enough leaf litter, just, uh, you know, uh, just, just soil litter. Um, nobody really knows. And I've had people tell me that they've had people tell them <laughs> that, oh, yeah, they diapause in the soil. The thing is, areified mites, that whole order of mites is a very to use the same analogy to before, it's like a roulette wheel. The ones that you can find information on the full life cycle, it doesn't help because some diapause on the plant itself, which that doesn't make sense on an annual. So if they're diapausing, are they going down into the soil to diapause? Possibly. But the only way that this grower would be getting areified mite or hemp russet mites in purchased soil is if he's purchasing the soil from an old cannabis farm. So mm -hmm. they're not just going to be naturally occurring in soil that's being sold and being amended and all of that and sold as commercial soil. Um, you know, there the, may the, be some sort of dormancy period though, where these are able to survive potentially in the soil. We just don't know is, is what I'm we hearing. Don't, we, we don't know. That's the thing. We don't know. And until, until it's kind of like when people tell me that they've seen hemp russet mite eggs, they're like, well, we don't have them, but I know we have them because we found their eggs. I'm like, take a picture and prove that it's hemp russet mite eggs and you'll make a lot of money off of it because nobody has a picture of them. Nobody knows what they look like, really. Um, they haven't been studied on the degree that they need to be, which is in a laboratory uh, or research greenhouse university setting. So until then, unfortunately, people have a lot of theories, but at the end of the day, they're just theories. And the chances of you vectoring hemp russet mite in any way except bringing them in on plants that you bought um, is very low, in my opinion. Yes, they can travel on gusts of wind. Yes, they can get on your clothing and then rub up against a plant. Um, can they come in on other pests? We don't know for sure, but we know broad mite do. So I think that 
I've seen photos of uh, citrus rust mite, which is almost identical to to uh, hemp russet mite. They jump off of plants and they can't fly. So I don't think they would jump off for any reason except to either catch a wind current or maybe catch a ride on a, who knows, on a, a broad mite will attach to a white fly and let the white fly take it to another plant. Um, but with all of those potentials, yes, they can do all of that. I think 99% of the hemp russet mite cases we work with, I tell the people, you bought these. You bought these when you bought these <laughs> plants that they came in. So, like, you know, be aware that you were killing bugs that you paid for. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Um, one, okay, so I have a couple more questions for this podcast, and I, I think I'd like to do just a separate follow-up one because I know the thing that you wanted to talk about was the cannabis aphid. And, oh uh, yeah, and and, and, already... and it's just it's we've talked it to death this year and the last couple of years. It's just one that I feel like it needs to be talked to death until growers are uh, terrified of it, <laughs> so they actually stay on top of managing it. A hundred percent. Let's let's save that one and do another Sounds podcast good. here. But uh, I did have a couple other questions that kind of fit with this sort of Q and A podcast that we're doing right now. So uh, one of the things we talked about was. Uh, and because of Suzanne, I always tell folks to work directly with an insectary or go to an insectary to make sure you're getting, you know, not only just good information, but as well as fresh bugs. And can you talk a little bit about that process or what your thoughts on are on it? Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and for sure, you know, when I, I used to buy a lot of bugs, I would buy through resellers. And then occasionally when I was lucky and working directly with uh, manufacturers now, as times change, we do change our business approach sometimes. And the truth is, I mean, we have a really deadly smart, good team of guys here, but there's four of us. And um, we can't really get out and, and visit growers all around the country. So um, we do work with some distributors that usually are uh, larger ag distributors that are selling products that growers are already buying, already need a lot of times are already set up with accounts with these companies that are providing stuff like uh, the conventional stuff that they will use, fertilizers, um, uh, soil, irrigation. Uh, but one thing that we do is we try to, at least with these larger companies that we're working with, we're doing drop shipping. So when a grower works with this rep who it may not, this rep that they're working with may not work for us, they're providing our bugs directly from our company. Um, so they, we ship them from our facility in Redding, California to you. There's no middleman. So they're coming to you absolutely as fresh as possible, most times within 24 hours. Um, and also, we try to work with these distributors that are open to having us come out and visit their growers with them. When we make time to visit, sometimes it's, you know, we have ones that are working with growers in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida. So when we visit out there, we'll link up with these reps that are selling them our bugs and these other products and say, hey, let's go visit so-and-so. So that way the grower still gets direct access to our specialists. They have our contact info. They can reach out to us for technical support and stuff. Um, a lot of times we have other, we do have a few other sellers that there is kind of a a middleman person that they do keep a separation between us and their customers. Now, most times companies like that are going to be a lot more knowledgeable in biocontrol than say some of the bigger ag companies, because you have a rep who's pretty much selling everything versus a rep who's dedicated to biocontrol. However, those companies may not want a direct relationship with suppliers and their customers. So we're kind of cut off from them. Um, it is kind of, at the end of the day, I just want you to buy our bugs. I really, I, I want, I want to, as, as many people to get our bugs into their greenhouses, to their grow rooms or to their farms as possible. Um, it is kind of the grower's decision. If you want access with your reps, um, with the technical end of what we provide and potential visits to your location, um, you need to be working with one of these distributors that is getting it direct from us that is open to us visiting. And, you know, the thing is these reps are also selling bugs for other producers too. Um, and every chance that they're probably uh, working with them and visiting, but that that's, that's how we can connect with the growers and it's how I'm not going to run our team of four 
just completely ragged trying to work directly with every single grower that reaches out because it, it is it's 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 a challenge there's a lot of support involved in what we do so the key takeaway i think for people listening to this podcast is make sure the bugs are being shipped direct from insectaries um, for sure and and that's just to make sure that they're as fresh as possible because now if you're if you're a four by four tent or, you know, a few lights, you may not have that option. You may only want a hundred, 150 or something. You may have to go sure. with, uh, you know, someone that's, that's buying the bugs in as a middleman and then re stat, re, like, distributing them, you but know, they may not be as fresh. Uh, exactly. Unfortunately, we only go down so small in order sizes. So sometimes these, the, the third party, uh, that is a good, a good time for them to shine where they do they can break things down into smaller units and and in their defense it's not like these are just getting shipped to some hot warehouse where they're going to sit for days um, most of these resellers have cold rooms that they're doing all of the opening opening and repackaging in there so it's never coming out of that target temperature the worst case is sometimes you have an extra day in transit now the reality of all of this is um, to be perfectly honest, we sell some stuff that we don't produce, some stuff that, and, and that's the case with every producer. Don't let them tell you differently. Um, we all buy and sell bugs to each other at times. So sometimes we are buying bugs from Europe. Um, they're six days in transit. I used European bugs for years in my greenhouses uh, because BI wasn't even really producing a lot of greenhouse products back then. BI was mainly doing lacewing and trichogramma and a few other things, but no aureus, no cucumeris, nothing like that yet. So, I mean, for many, many years, everybody successfully did biocontrol with bugs that were six days in transit. So it's not that it's not that extra transit is going to impact the quality. It's just you're adding a lot more chances for something to go wrong. Um, and we do as much on our end as we can. These third-party resellers are doing as much as they can by having a cold room, but we are totally at the mercy of UPS and FedEx or whoever's moving those bugs. So the quicker, the less time they have it, the more comfortable I am. Yeah. It, I know you and Suzanne have both taught classes on how to even evaluate the bugs that you are receiving to know that they're viable, not just alive, but actually going to go out there and, and eat a target pest. Yep. And that's a whole nother conversation in class and, and probably better done live in person. But and that's what one, I, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, just real quickly. I, and it's, it kind of plays into, and, and I'll, I will make it quick. I just want to kind of a promotion for BI, but um, we have been one thing that we have been working on during this downtime, which is cool. Um, I had developed a series of release instruction videos in the last year and a half or so, uh, just kind of quick little minute and a half, two minute long videos on our YouTube channel where growers can go if they get a bottle of what X, Y, Z and say, because we send printed instructions with them, but a lot of times it's just so much easier to just watch 30 seconds of somebody actually using it to say, Oh, okay. That's how I'm supposed to do that. So uh, one thing that we, have recently been adding during this downtime, uh, the rep Saul that I mentioned earlier, he's bilingual. So we have gone and all of our videos, we also now have available with uh, Spanish audio over for Spanish speaking uh, IPM management, which is something we're running into a lot more often now. Um, so, but that plays into, now that we've got pretty much all of our release videos for our bugs done, we're gonna move into the next project is a series of videos on scouting and a series of videos on QC of incoming bugs, of knowing what to look for, all of that stuff. So, and moving forward, now that we have the gift of, the, of a bilingual specialist, all of our videos will debut in English and Spanish at the same time. Hey, that's great. We'll put a link on the podcast page to the YouTube channel so people can check that out. Uh, cool, what, what bugs are you most famous for producing? Uh, I wanted to cover that real quick. I, I, oh man, I'm probably speaking out of turn, but I thought I remembered it was cucumeris. If you're on the West coast, it's the fastest, e easiest way to get cucumeris. Is that right? I would. Yeah. If you're on the West coast of the United States, um, I don't see a way for you to get them quicker than us. Uh, 
I would say BI is probably most known historically because this BI has been around for 35 years. It's not until the last about 12 years that <laughs> Cynthia, our owner, expanded it out and she recruited uh, some people with a bigger emphasis in greenhouse products because for years BI has been a huge producer of lacewing is probably what we're known the best for just because we I might be overstating but we've got to be one of the largest producers in North America of lacewing uh, we produce a lot of trichogramma wasps which are used to control various moths you know um, but as far as with the greenhouse is using they use a lot of lacewing in there but for me I really fell in love with BI when I found out about our aureus um, Aureus, Cucumeris, Stratio, uh, Stratiolae laps, Delosia. Um, we have 10 or 12 organisms that we produce right here in Redding that ship out. Like you said, I don't see a way for you to get them quicker. It's no knock against any other company, just they have to ship internationally to get them to you. Whereas, you know, you're up in the Seattle area. Of course, today's Friday, so it's an exception. But you know, Monday morning you call, hey Kelly, I've got a real problem. I need uh, I need some cucumeris bulk and I need some cucumeris sachets. Um, you know, the very longest it's gonna take, you're gonna have them on Wednesday. You call us early enough on Monday, you might have them on Tuesday. So uh uh yeah, that's and that's not even just because you're on the west coast, it could be you're in New York. It's it's overnight shipping either way once we get it once we get it there. Sometimes orders come in late in the day. We don't get the production and the shipping at time at that time. Um, now, right now, things are day to day with the whole COVID situation just because of all the shippers that we do use. So um, a lot of things I will just kind of put an asterisk on just to, as a as a you know just a CYA type of uh, situation right now. But um, so far, we've had no issues with deliveries. We've had no issues with our shipments being impacted. But of course, we're living in strange times. But when everything's running as normal, um, yeah, I mean, I ordered Aureus the first time from Beneficial and Sectory, and I got them the next day. As I was used to placing orders on Thursday to get my bugs the following Wednesday. Um, that's a game changer, you know, because a lot of times in a green high, in, a, in a pest management, situation if you've been gone for a few days or you just didn't scout that area good enough and you come in and you say oh my god look at these spider mites i've got to do something in the next two days um if your bugs if we can't get bugs to you in two days at the most or at, you know if we can't get them to you any quicker than that you're going to spray and then you're going to nuke your biocontrol program so the quicker that you can say i need to do something about that i can get bugs for it and attack it that way instead of setting everything back and starting again because I sprayed. Yeah, I, I do want to highlight there are other insectaries out there. Uh, Beneficial is obviously a great one. Um, you know, you come highly recommended by Suzanne. There are, and, and there's, there's a ton of different insectaries. Well, not a ton. There's a limited amount of insectaries in the world uh, when you actually think about it. And uh, I, I would highlight that there's a lot of different release methods that all of these insectaries have. And that's probably a whole nother conversation that's probably better done with visuals as well. Yeah. Cause there's pros and oh, cons sure. to all these different release, you know, sachets and bulk and all of this stuff. And I, I think once someone gets on a, a program that works for their facility, and I want to talk, I have a question for you around this. Um, in theory, you're not having to order these frantic, you know, orders last minute and, and need them in two days. It's, it's nice that that's a possibility, but I know someone right. like Justin has, he has a standard order now and uh, this works. So he knows exactly when he needs throughout the month to get these bugs in there just to maintain his, his preventative IPM. But right. uh, my note on that would be on, on forums a lot of times, or, you know, on Instagram, social media, media, you see a lot of people like, Hey, what's this bug? And not only do you see a ton of misidentification and misinformation uh, around yeah. biocontrol yeah. advice, but let's say someone has, you know, aphid and they say, Oh, you need uh, you need a Phidias or you need uh, you know, lace wings or whatever. That isn't enough information to get good biocontrol success. And no. I know one thing Suzanne has really like 
harped on me for is that that sounds bad. <laughs> One thing she's really drilled into my head is that uh, every situation and environment, grow environment is unique and requires a custom approach. You can't, you know, these rates vary so dramatically based on every situation yep. because you highlighted there isn't a standard growing methodology for cannabis like you would get with exactly. some of these other crops. So can you just yep. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, especially, and I'm glad you used aphid as the example because aphid is the one that uh, I tell people, like, if you ask me one question about your aphids, prepare for 20 out of me before I give you an answer because the most important thing is that what aphid is it that matters because if if we're gonna if we're approaching let's say you're in a situation where you need to use wasps it's critical to know which aphid you have or if you don't know which a lot of growers don't and they don't have a way to get it identified you know in their defense um you know uh, suzanne and and me uh, and and i are big about get your bug id if you don't know what it is get it id the reality is I've sent bugs off for ID from my greenhouse and entomologists have work to do. So you get an ID about five weeks later, uh, four and a half weeks after you sprayed because you had to do something. Um, but it is important to know which aphid you have. Um, with thrips too, a lot of times, it, I, I, it's a bad habit that a lot of us have. I just say thrips. I should say Western flower thrips because what's true for Western flower thrips isn't always true for chili thrips or onion thrips or greenhouse thrips or echino thrips or Cuban laurel thrips or all the various ones. So there's that. For one, you need to know that you're using the right species to attack. Now, in the case of like lacewing larvae, that's what I love about lacewing. They don't care. They're going to eat aphids if they have access to them. But are you in a situation where lacewing might not be a good approach and then you have to use wasps? Um, you can release both and know that you're controlling it. But if you know which aphid you have, if you know for a fact that you have a green peach aphid, there's no need to release aphidious ervi, which are expensive. You can release aphidious colmani, which are not as expensive. Um, if you don't get that aphid ID, you got to release both if you want to know that you're covering your butt. And then another example of, like I said, maybe you want to use wasps. Um, now this is, this is, uh, this is something that I have observed in the field quite a lot in the last few years. Uh, a couple of the guys at work have also made similar observations. So a lot of times I like to start with a disclaimer. I'm not making a scientific statement that I have uh, research to show this. It's just field observations and feedback from our growers. But one thing that I'm starting to notice in cannabis and hemp, and not just cannabis and hemp, any plant that in its late pubescent stage gets these heavy trichomes. A good example in the ornamentals world would be petunias um, and, or, or just greenhouse tomatoes is a good example as well, where if you're familiar with the lacewing larva with its anatomy, I mean, they, they, they look like little alligators with six legs, kind of. They're, they're, they kind of drag their belly on the ground when they walk, and they, they're not exactly small. They do like to get into tight areas and feed, but they don't seem to really they're not thrilled about going into areas of hugely dense trichomes that they obviously have trouble navigating. So if you have an aphid issue on a plant that's a week seven of flower, throwing lacewing larvae in it might not be the right approach. So then, you, then it is critical to know w that's not the answer. That's not gonna work. We need to do wasps. And then which wasp do we need to do? White fly is another good one. White fly, you need to know which white fly to know that you're using the right parasitoid for it. So. Anybody that just comes on a forum and says, hey, what do I do about aphids? And somebody gives them an answer. Um, they really didn't ask enough questions. Uh, it, almost any almost any situation. I need to know what stage the, the plant's in, what you're growing. Uh, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's something like thrips, um, you know, it's important to know, are you a hydroponic grower? Because if you are, then we can't be putting stratiolalaps in the soil that you don't have, you know. So uh, uh, forums, uh, forums and social media, and I used to belong to a lot of different insect ID groups on Facebook, and I just got so frustrated because it's, I felt like, and, and it's funny, I, I teased Suzanne about this. She spends 90% of her time online just having to go in and c just correct all of this bad info, and it's great that people are out there doing it. It's just exhausting for me. And um, 
at the end of the day, when there's no research to back up some of this stuff, you get to a point where I can say everything I just said, but the next guy can come in and say something and I can't prove them wrong and they can't prove me wrong. And then it's like, it's like when you go on Reddit looking for an answer to something and you read this long response and it's like, huh, that guy sounds like they're really making sense. Uh, that's probably the right answer. And then you read the very next one and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that one makes sense too. So it's, it's a little wild west in that area. But anybody that says, what do I do for aphids? Hey, just throw ladybugs at them. You didn't put enough thought into it and chances are it's not going to work. Yeah, I want to say that timing also is important and application rate and environment in terms of your your lighting, your humidity, your your temperatures can all play a role. So it's really important, I think, that people get a program that's really customized to them. And I know you've mentioned ladybugs a couple of times. I just want to make sure uh, if you're thinking about buying ladybugs, please go back and listen to the last podcast because there's a lot of challenges around these wild harvested ladybugs. And I yeah. Um, I, I hope people aren't purchasing those. I know there are some insectary, insectary reared ladybugs, but it's really rare, and that's not what 99% of the and, population is and, doing. So. And most times, and they're not the ones you're going to be buying at a grow shop either. Um, the yeah. insectary reared lady beetles are not the traditional ones that most people think of when they say ladybug. These are ones that are specialized for going after different pests like mealybugs or um, even one, there is one that goes after spider mites, but, um, not the ones that you're buying at a grow shop. Those, as you said, wild harvested, it's one of those things that if there's something to get up on a soapbox about, that's one. And that's, that's my soapbox thing that I get up on. It's like, look, ladybugs showing up on their own are your friend. You don't need to, you don't need to worry. You're not hurting anybody by letting them come and hang out in your garden or on your crop. But buying them is just, it's kind of spitting in the face of, of sustainability in my opinion it's taking yeah. them out of where taking them out of where we need them i just wanted to clarify that just to make sure growers weren't buying any any ladybirds or anything like that yeah i'm not going to scream at you for it but i might wag my finger at you a little bit yeah cool well one other thing I wanted to cover real quick was uh, talking about your staff and how you guys work with a grower. Cause we just talked about the importance of a customized approach. You mentioned a little bit that some of these, uh, some of these distributors will allow you and your staff to come in and, you know, maybe even tour greenhouse or, or, or tour a facility or work directly with the grower and coming up with a program. You're still buying the bugs through the distributor. You're not selling direct, but, um, how do how do people interact with your staff? And, and get, let's do a quick little bio about the four people that they may interact with over at Beneficial. Beneficial, because I've met them all. You guys are all great guys. Uh, let's take a yeah, moment and, sure. and plug that. Yeah, I've got a great team. Um, two two that well, I guess three kind of that I'm res all of them. I'm kind of had a hand in getting them on board here. Uh, Greg Greg Bryant. He lives in Colorado. Um, Greg joined up with us uh, around summer last year. Or a year before, I'm sorry. And uh, Greg actually came to us from a, a, one of our competitors. So he had a little bit of experience already um, in doing exactly what we do. And prior to that, had experience working with nematode colonies and did, uh, he did work in uh, uh, efficacy trials with pesticides and greenhouses and stuff. So he's got a really cool entomology background. Um, and then we have Saul Alba, who's down in Los Angeles. Um, Saul is the one who was uh, about 15 minutes into the first time I visited him as a grower, you know, as a supplier customer relationship. I asked him if he'd ever think about coming to work for us. And then about two years later, he, he finally took me up on my offer. Um, Saul is a licensed PCA in the state of California. He's got IPM hands-on experience in large greenhouse cannabis, which is um, and actually, he when I first met him, he was working in organic herbs. Uh, he's grown, done IPM in mushrooms and uh, uh, vineyards and worked in wine chemistry before that. So he's got a really cre uh, incredible background of chemical uh, and, and macrobiological, plus the licensed PCA part. Not that we sell insecticides, but it's good to have someone licensed to consult in it because we can go a little deeper in working with growers that are coming off of conventional programs and getting them more towards chemistry that's a little friendlier to what we do. 
And then our most recent addition uh, to the team is Eric Vanderslice. He lives up in the Portland area. Um, Eric was, I knew him as an IPM manager from another uh, very large ornamentals greenhouse operation up there, very similar to the one that I worked for. In fact, the two companies did business together. Um, but prior to that, Eric is one of the weird ones that he crossed over from cannabis into ornamentals, not the other way around, because he had a, a couple years as head grower for a large cannabis operation in Washington. So our, our team is just full of this diverse background of experience. So that's, I just had to do a little bragging about them. Um, <laughs> The way generally that they'll work with us, it depends if, we, you know, like the show that we did in Portland where I saw you last, a lot of times we meet people, we get their information there and we'll reach out to them, um, get them connected with who they need to, to get uh, orders placed. And then if it's someone within driving distance, of course, we get out there as soon as possible. If it's someone that's in a different part of the country um, that we do have other area, other stuff that we work at there, you know. Personally, I like to try to get a visit to the place as soon as possible because just like I said with the release videos, sometimes it takes 30 minutes for me to explain something that takes 30 seconds to show you. Um, sometimes I can, I've had growers that I've worked with for a year or two years and never seen their facility and then somehow something happens where I get a chance and you go out there and you're like, oh, this is not what I – it's like when you're reading a book and then you watch the movie – and they don't look anything like you expected them to. Some growers are really bad at explaining, and I'm not just blaming the growers, but some are really bad at explaining what their greenhouses or their rooms look like or what they don't know their own square footage a lot of times. So just me putting eyes on it one time helps. Now with with COVID and, and our travel being very limited right now, we're trying to encourage more growers to be a little active in uh, sending us photos that works that that works better than explaining it to us sometimes just walk around take about 20 photos of your location send them to me then tell me which one is greenhouse a and greenhouse b or greenhouse 21 and greenhouse 22 and then that way i have in my photos i have folders for each of the customers that i've visited that i put the photos in there from so it's like if if tad calls me and he's got an issue I can go and see what Tad's greenhouse looks like because the sad truth is after four years of working here, it gets hard to remember a lot of them sometimes. It's hard to even wrap my head around how many places I've visited at this point. But the sooner we can get a visit, the better. Sometimes that doesn't work out if we can get photos and get growers started. Um, a lot of times growers, it's, it's how much they want to share with us. If they're willing to share stuff like a production schedule with us, we can get them going like your friend Justin where, okay, we know when you're going to plant, when you're going to harvest. We know when the plants are switching, uh, when they're going to be transplanted. We can lay out some groundwork right here. And then there's no such thing as subscription biocontrol. There's no set it and forget it. You can set up certain things like sachets, releases of stratios, stuff like that. We still, in my opinion, I think it's like you got to go to the doctor for a checkup. We have to check up every now and then and just – touch base you might have certain cultivars that get a little bit of pest pressure um but you know we're, most of the time we're just a phone call away we do travel a lot so sometimes we're unavailable immediately but we all will get back with you within 24 hours of, a, of an email or text or phone call coming in um you yeah know, that's a good point do, you're constantly I, tweaking your program it's never a set it and forget it it is something that's always being you know adapted yeah. to a given, you know, your given situation seasonally. You get or... better over time. You get better at just kind of knowing what you need. And you, some things are pretty much set it and forget it. Like you can pro you can, you can forecast out nematode drenches or like I said, uh, stratio laylapse releases. If you know, you're going to have X amount of plants, but um, as far as pest pressure goes, you're not going to have consistent spider mite pressure throughout the entire crop, consistent thrips pressure. So you, you have to, but for a certain amount of it, it can be set up ahead of time. And then it's like, um, you know, you, you go out and you scout, which everybody should be doing, whether you're on a subscription biocontrol or subscription spray or whatever you're doing, you need to be scouting. You scout and you say, you know what? Um, sometimes if you're doing really good, you can reduce what you were going to buy. You know what? I don't need that extra blah, blah, blah. Um, 
sometimes you say, oh, well, uh, that new strain that we have is really getting hit by spider mites. So we need to tack on an extra bottle of persimilis to push those back. So um, for the most part, we're never done communicating with the grower. I mean, it, they're never going to be done having pest, pest challenges. And I mean, we do, we have some growers that they can't even place an order without calling and talking to us. And that's what we're here for, you know, to support them. Yeah. You know, you had your soapbox moment around ladybugs or lady beetles. And I, I want to have a quick one around what you just, what you just mentioned. Cause I get, I get blurry photos and videos all the time of insects. <laughs> and let me just start off by saying, I am not going to identify your insect. I don't, I'm not an right. entomologist. I don't have enough experience. I know what I right. don't know. I mean, I can guess. I'm, I'm pretty good at that, but I'm not going to do that for your grow. It's just not, right. it wouldn't be ethical of me. But I would right. happily refer you to someone like Suzanne, someone like Kelly, and they can identify. But they're not going to be able to identify off of, you know, 90% of the images I get are not high enough resolution to no. make an identification. And that's, so invest in something I know Suzanne loves dino lights. I have a dino light. I love it. I don't want to make yep. it sound like they're the only things that take a good picture because that's not true. You know true. what, though? Years ago, though, I gave up on trying to not sound like I'm marketing dino light because they're, <laughs> they're, they're so easy to find. There's so many other ones out there that, that I have bought the other ones, and it's really a crapshoot of quality. Whereas, and again, I don't get paid by dino light. I don't think you do. I don't, I don't think Suzanne does. They really just are, it's like, dram auto foggers i don't get paid by them i just want to tell you what the best one to use is and well i do opinion, sell dino lights now because of suzanne so i do i oh, it's you do a very, sell very okay, small well, margin but i do i do carry them now yeah dude they're they're <laughs> they're indispensable i mean nobody has an excuse to not have one at this point they're you can get the dino light basic is like 125 bucks at the most I mean, what is your crop worth to you? One plant is worth, I mean, that's a fraction of what you make off one plant. So um, I have a slide that I do in a lot of talks just called Help Me Help You. And I use it as a collage of all of the just atrocious pictures that I've gotten sent where it's like, dude, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I can't tell if that's a mite or an aphid or if it's even a plant, you know. So, But there's someone been, that will identify that for you on a forum confidently. Of course. It's a root yeah. aphid. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, uh, I'm trying to use COVID as a little bit of an, a, a, a motivator to people like, look, you know, things, nobody could have seen this coming, but, you know, we need to take into account things happen sometimes that like, I just cannot come out there and see you. And if I can't come out and shake your plants out, and identify your bugs you got to get good pictures to me you got to get good at doing you know and and we're open to doing getting on skype and you know put us on your phone and walk around your room with us where we can see it um but this right now should be the biggest reason for people to start communicating being better i mean we're all doing zoom meetings and stuff to to check in and most people are working from home if they can um so it's time times like this gear up and have good ways to send us good photos because the truth is I've been looking at bugs for 20 years. Um, I still have, I still have to have an incredibly clear picture for me to with certainty tell you. Um, now I can with certainly t certainty tell you if it's a thrip or a spider mite or thrips. Oh, I sh Suzanne's going to rake me over the coals for that. It's thrips. <laughs> no, it's never thrip. It's thrips. Um, I can tell you if it's a thrips or a spider mite. Um, a lot of times I can tell you, yeah, it's Western flower thrips, but those are rare when I get a photo that good. Most times it's a blurry photo of what ends up being springtails or something like that. But um, yeah, that's a good soapbox to get up on. And I believe was it you or Suzanne who did a talk specifically on that at the biocontrol show about being better at taking photos. And <laughs> that was Suzanne. Mine was on was that evaluating products for your garden, making good production decisions in terms of what you need to do in terms of research and, and scientific method when you're going to bring any product into your garden. Uh, that yeah. was my talk, which was fun. Okay. But um, the other side I see on my side of the industry with soil is I'll get a photo of a leaf and they want me, they want me to tell them what's going on, you know, whether it's a deficiency, whether it's a pest, oh, yeah. whether, yeah. and 
you you literally can't. So like I I'll come back and I'll need to see a photo of the entire plant for one, so I can see if it's a mobile nutrient. If it is a nutrient yeah. deficiency, I need to know if yeah. there are pest pressure. What other things you might have foliar sprayed? What kind of lighting? What your environment looks like? How are you watering? What's the hydrology process with your soil? Like that's yeah. that's a huge thing when it comes to deficiencies. Uh, and you know, ninety the soil gets blamed for everything in, in most of cases course. or nutrient programs. And to be fair, a lot of times it can be something like that. But with a lot of these, you know, living soil programs, I'm finding a lot of times it's, it's, it comes down to the watering or other stuff that they're doing that they forget yeah. that they do. And that's where going to the facility, like you said, you may look over in a corner and see a bottle of something and be like, Oh, are you using that? And they're like, Oh yeah, we used it. And we just forgot to put it on the email. And those are the kind yeah. of things that you miss from these photos. That's so important. And, uh, that's just something that well, I, that would probably water, be my biggest soapbox moment. <laughs> water, water management is it's, I mean, it really is the foundation of so many things. Like it, it really ripples out to affecting how effective every other thing you do is. And, you know, for an instance, like, it's funny because you say the soil gets blamed for everything. Sometimes you just can't help the soil you're growing in. So you have to learn how to manage the soil that you have. I have growers that they got in over their heads trying to do living soil in very shallow raised beds. And now they have gone a little overboard and they've got this incredibly organic soil that, I mean, they might as well be growing in compost. So now there's a lot of stuff, a lot of a lot of bioactivity in there they hadn't accounted for. Another thing that's going on, the same one, um, all of their old mulch and stuff that's in there decaying is now just playing a huge host to uh, isopods, to, to roly polies, pill bugs. And oh, they're yeah. actually starting to damage their young plants. They're, they're feeding on the skin, like basically girdling these small plants. Now, they really do need to just once they harvest just change this out this whole system out that's what i told them the last harvest and they still growing in the same spot this year with some of the same problems but another thing that has a lot to do with all of that stuff happening the way it is is the fact that they overwater um underwatering is not or you know backing off the water is not going to fix that problem but it's certainly going it's not going to make it worse just like a lot of times we have growers who get concerned when they see huge abundance of springtails. Uh, for one, springtails aren't really a bad bug, but I like to say springtails are good scouts because springtails like dead roots. So if I walk past a plant that's just exploding with springtails, I know that springtails aren't the problem, but I want to know why so many springtails have something to eat. That tells me there's a lot of dead roots in this plant. So is it a, is it a soil? You know, do I have a, a, a root disease? Uh, do I have something going on there? Nine times out of 10, it's overwatering because springtails, uh, for one, are you familiar with them? Yes. I see them a lot in these grows. You know, springtails, if you know a little bit about them, they're, they're technically, they're not even insects. They're a whole separate uh, group of arthropods called Columbula. They're very, they share a common ancestor, but they're technically not insects. And, and if you look at them, you look at their anatomy, you can see it. Just certain things don't don't match up, uh, you know, uh, totally wingless, um, very, very primitive compared to an insect when it comes down to their actual physiology. And, and the main way is uh, insects have very, very primitive kind of lungs that I like to compare it to like the chambers inside of like a harmonica or something. Uh, isopods or a, a columbula, even less, they have to diffuse water, uh, oxygen out of water. So they have to have, they have to be wet to breathe. So what does that tell you? If you, if you want to thin their numbers out, they cannot live in dry soil, but I have growers that just keep battling springtails, not battling them, but they don't, you know, they're saying, well, why do we have so many of them? You don't have any diseases. Um, you're overwatering. They can't breathe if you take that water out of there, but they'll blame the soil, they'll blame you know, the roots or the, you know, what do I need to spray? You know, you need to spray less water. That's what you need to do. <laughs> well, I, I was under the impression that springtails not only ate dead roots, but other forms of organic matter as well. So if you're using a soil that has high levels of compost or you're recycling soil sure. beds with these, you know, uh, flower rooms, you're going to have root hairs that are just left over from the previous grow. Is that, yeah. 
a concern because the, my, uh, my, my thought on the other side of this is, well, if we start having wet dry cycles or allow the soil to dry out too much, then we're reducing our nutrient cycling on a microbial level. There's, there's a balance there for sure. You can definitely overwater. Um, right. Where, where does concern, that balance lie? I guess. Uh, my, the, the, yeah, and you are right about them being kind of a, a little more of a generalist detrivore, that they're going to feed on other stuff as well. The concern with it um, that I have actually seen this in person, and it's kind of like the, the, the pill bugs damaging these, these plants. Usually pill bugs, they're not a pest. Good luck trying to find any information on controlling pill bugs um, because all of everything you're going to find that reads is going to say they feed on rotting things. They don't feed on new cannabis plants, but here they are feeding on them. And it's a lot of times when you get an abundance of something and it doesn't have, it has way too much competition for its preferred food source, they get creative. They may not, you know, infest a plant like they're going to if they were aphids or thrips or anything like that. But in my case, it was a crop of dianthus, of carnations that was just they're a very tricky plant to water, um, and if you're not careful, you'll overwater them. And people weren't careful, and they're pretty much constantly overwatered. So that was my little—I called it the popcorn because it's like just springtails jumping out of every pot. Um, and I would pull the the roots out to make sure, you know, that they're they're not doing the damage that that I assumed they could. And then lo and behold, we start finding them feeding on live roots and damaging our plants. And it was only because I have, they're so untended that they're running out of dead roots. There's too many. It, this, it's like this place is so abundantly good for them. Now there's too many of them. And at that point, you have to back off of the water. Um, you want springtails in your soil. You know, you, you want isopods in your soil. You don't want them to the point that they're so hungry that they're going to start costing you money. That's a good point. That's a good point. I have seen the the roly poly bugs, uh, girdling plants, yeah. like you mentioned. I had never, <laughs> I'd never seen that until working with it. There's a lot of things I had never seen until working in cannabis. And I'm not trying to poke fun or anything, but a lot of times growers like the, the whole living soil. And I have a lot of growers that are big into, you know, Korean natural, the K and F growing. Um, it's one, like you can really screw it up if you don't follow the, the fundamentals of it. And you can end up with a really funky soil going on that like you might have just created a whole lot of problems for yourself yeah no i i i get that i there's certain things about no-till growing and uh you know some of these processes that i don't believe translate well to controlled environment agriculture now as you know i'm a big proponent of living soils i personally, however, don't believe in using uh, cover crops indoors and uh, living mulches right. or even mulches in general because of the, some of the challenges that you mentioned. We just don't have the diversity, biodiversity that you see outdoors. It allows for these things to be really it's, effective. But and some people do it successfully, so I don't want to say that oh, there's only one way to do oh, it. I don't want oh, no, to them, but... And, and, and I, I have, we have a grow that we work with up in northern uh, Washington, like in the northern Okanagan Valley, that right when I was starting to kind of almost think like, God, I hate these, these no-till growers because they're not doing it right. I went and visited this farm, and it's to this day I use them as an example. It's like one of the healthiest, just like most kick-ass farms I've ever been to because these guys are committed. It's, and biocontrol is very similar, like – when you commit to it and you see what it can do, it's great. But if you go in half-hearted and you're not going to stick to it, it's the same thing with something as involved and time and, and with as much time involved as building a good no-till environment for soil. And I'm, I would assume much like ours, you have a better chance of uh, succeeding when you have access to people who know about it and can support you with it. Uh, soil, much the same approach, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I find that uh, running a, a cover crop, just it creates another crop that you have to manage, which is challenging indoors. It's potentially going to be another vector for anything from pathogens to insects and, and pests. And then, 
these mulches, I, I think you can get carried away with organic matter. It's already going to be really high if you're running a living soil. So mm -hmm. those are my concerns. I mean, they, they all are very cool, sustainable concepts that I a hundred percent believe in when it comes to agriculture or outdoors, but indoors, sure. I just, you don't get that same level of diversity. And then in terms of no-till, I get this question a lot. So I, I have a blog post on it with my thoughts. Again, this is all of my, just my opinion, but for me, um, I like to mix nutrients into the soil and disturb the soil when I reamend a living soil bed because we are cropping so rapidly that I want to get those nutrients down into the rhizosphere uh, quickly. Sure. I don't, if we're using organic amendments and we're not using mineral salts, I don't have the luxury of that time for that to break down like I would outdoors. Because outdoors, you know, if you're growing in agricultural land, sure, you don't have to till, you can top dress. Um, you can uh, allow, you can run, you know, other crops during off crop cycles. You can allow that soil to rest. There's all these other things. But if you're trying to bring in your next crop 24 to 36 hours later into yeah. a flower room, I like to get those nutrients mixed into the soil. And I get these questions a lot. So I just want to mention them on the end of this podcast just because. Well, yeah, I uh, mean, you, you got to take into account you're growing a crop that you're growing a crop that it, right out of the gate is just a very hungry crop that is that you're deliberately trying to give it as much as possible to produce as healthy of a plant. So as you said, outdoors, you have all of these, all of these processes working that you don't have working indoors that, um, yeah. And with production, I mean, we can do it as natural and as, as by, you know, by mother nature's, guide as possible but i've said this many times there is no such thing as natural farming we have to accept that when we decide to put in a big mass quantity of a crop that didn't just spring up out of the earth on its own we have to do some things differently we can keep it as close to you know what mother nature is providing us but mother nature this spot didn't evolve over the last million years thinking that I was going to plant a cannabis crop here or even <laughs> even a field of corn. Um, so we can do what was naturally in place here. We can amend the soil naturally, but we do have to take some steps. We have to ramp up some numbers, whether it's predators or whether it's nutrition in the soil. Um, you know, especially when we're growing at such an, uh, uh, a borderline unrealistic level of quality, <laughs> you know, that's it's growing it's like it's like everybody's trying to grow orchids you're growing perfect plants so you have to have the nutrition in the soil and something that i will never shake from working in such large environments and with such large crops and working selling to box stores is there was an infinite emphasis on uniformity um it, hanging baskets had to be identical you know um sometimes plants there were no visual flaws it just wasn't the right shape so it has to go so you get you very early learn the importance of the assurance of knowing like what you're saying putting those nutrients back in the soil knowing that that stuff's going to be there because um you know in an ornamentals world you have to produce little cookie cutter plants that look exactly the same there's no way to do that without knowing okay i'm putting enough in for this crop at each turn yeah. Plus the, the breakdown of these cover crops, like let's say we have some nitrogen fixers in there. It's really hard to control the amount of nitrogen we're getting from the, you know, rhizobia and the clo the clover that may be, it may be living. Right. On. Uh, so managing nitrogen levels becomes more challenging, especially as we want to plant to senesce towards the end of its life cycle as we go to harvest yeah. it for flower. So it's just, it's, it's additional variability that personally I don't like to do, even though it, it sounds really good good and cool and, and fits with my ethics, I, I think it creates challenges on a commercial scale. But if you have a small four by four tent, by all means, like it, I exactly. think it works great in those situations. It's, it's all about scale, man. And it, we try our hardest to not become factory farms. Um, but at a certain point, you production dictates the way some things have to go. And, um, you know, it's like I say, there's always a place for craft growing. There's always a place. It's the reason there's still craft brewery and there's, there's craft brews and there's Budweiser, you know, um, it, there is a place for those true approaches like that. But when, 
you know, I come from the background of, uh, for many years, punching a clock and then getting in a golf cart to drive around my greenhouses because there was no way I could walk them all and realistically scout them in a day. So when you scale out to a certain point, yeah, you do have to, but still, I mean, as long as you're coming into it with that approach of doing as much as you can and only, only adding what you have to. And then when you do add, it's like with biocontrol, we're just putting in stuff that's, that's naturally occurring when you're amending soil, you're, 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 amending it with organic stuff. So the people that get stuck in no-till and they refuse to do uh, make changes, um, we have a grower who's dealing with some phylons every year. That's one that you don't ever, barely ever hear about, some phylons. They look like little teeny tiny centipedes that live down in the soil. And uh, they're an annual pest. Every year in the exact same spot on their farm, they get a huge issue with the roots being damaged. Um, you know, you have to do something about problems like that. Uh, with some phylons, a lot of times people plant potatoes as a as a crop to, to kind of get them out of the soil. Um, and that's what they're going to start doing next season. This, this season, they didn't get to it in time. And by the end of the season, I'll have some good pictures for you of what they do to plants. Hmm. That's cool. Well, I feel like you and I could talk all day. <laughs> I know you have for other sure, stuff man. to do. For and... sure, yeah. I got to get back to no, helping out with my new board, cool. but, uh, I let's catch up you soon. As much time. And yeah, I could talk about this stuff all day. And anytime you want to talk about the, the Foradon, the cannabis aphid, that is one I could probably focus on and just stay on topic for an entire show. <laughs> all right, man. Well, I'll, uh, I'll do a follow up with you here on the cannabis aphid, but thank you so much for your time today and you and, uh, you and your family stay safe. This is going to be a very dated podcast because we're talking about this virus. Hopefully, Sure. Hopefully six months a year, six months a year from now, uh, it won't be nearly the impact that we're all seeing. So, of course. Well, man, thank you so much for having me. And I'm sorry it took so long to make it happen. And, uh, but yeah, let's stay in touch. I look forward to hearing it. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, Dad. That was Kelly Vance with Beneficial Insectary, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget to check out our website at www.kisorganics.com for more information and resources and links to the topics we discussed on the show today. We also have a new seed starter mix on our website here in the United States, as well as a KISS soil mix and nutrient pack in Canada through Black Swallow Living Soils, so I suggest checking those guys out. And please sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage so you can stay up to date while you're there and give us a follow on Instagram at Kiss Organics so you can stay up to date on our upcoming grower profile series and virtual live tours. We are starting that this week with Michael Wilson at Maincraft Cannabis. Thanks for listening.